Uh, let us start with the uh, Mangala Charan. I invite uh, Dr. Geeta Kumari to present uh, the Mangala Charan. Chakre Chakra Vihanga Yori Vayudim Chakre Chakra Vihanga Yori Vayudim Nignan Pimohakshabam Vishle Ganidarthayo Kavi Mukam Hojam Samulla Sayan Shringaradi Jasanurakta Vibudendra Shamaso Purayan Shashwat Vishnu Patasthiro Vijayade Shashwat Vishnu Padasthiro Vijayade Sadbod Suryo Daya Shashwat Vishnu Padasthiro Vijayade Sadbod Suryo Daya So next speaker is uh, Dr. Kremensi uh, Model. Uh, she is a senior lecturer at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand, uh, and he is uh, he's in the Department of uh, Mathematics and Statistics. Uh, Christchurch is in New Zealand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've had beautiful Mangala Charanas and we've had Japanese um, poetry. So I thought I'd bring you some of my own cultural heritage, possibly unknown to many of you, the indigenous race of New Zealand, the Māori. And I've got one of their most famous proverbs here. Unfortunately, this does not have a, have a song with it, otherwise I would sing it with you. Maybe I'll do that in the vote of thanks. <clears throat> it goes like this. He aha te mea nui o te ao, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. And it translates, what is the most important thing in this world? It is people, it is people, it is people. And I think this is nice because it not only reflects the importance of what we do as historians, looking back at what people thought and did in ancient cultures, but also the importance of getting together ourselves as historians to discuss ideas, to share ideas, to critique each other's ideas, and to um, develop as a collective. Many brains are much better than one. It's something I'm probably the most valuable lesson that I'm learning as a scholar. Anyway. So the most important thing in the world uh, is people, but the second most important thing in the world are astronomical tables. <laughs> so um, over the last th three years or so, and probably for much of my career, along very happily with um, Dr. Kim Plofka, we have become completely obsessed with astronomical tables, um, particularly those in Sanskrit sources. We have one in particular here, of a table of a work we're looking at called the Brahma Tulu Sarani, which is in fact a tabular recasting, for want of a better word, of Bhaskara II's Karana Kutuhala. Or is it? How close is it? But there are some interesting features that we can say more generally about tables in Sanskrit sources, which I'll look at soon. But you'll notice we have, of course, many oops, tables, we have usually some titles. Some, sometimes some explanatory text around them. Here's another title here for a different table. If you're lucky, you get your rows labelled for you. We call this sort of information around the numerical data in the tables paratext because it can be of lots of different sorts, whether it be table, uh, titles or column headings. <clears throat> in fact, funnily enough, Professor M.D. Srinivas was looking over my shoulder yesterday and he said, oh, what are you looking at? And I said, oh, it's a table. He goes, oh, it's just a table. And I said, it's not just a table. So we will have a special session after this conference, especially with you, devoted to the importance of tables. But I think, interestingly, the point is, is that 
we fail to recognise tables anymore because we're surrounded by them, right? We have spreadsheets, which are usually administrative documents, so they make us feel slightly naughty if we've even looked at them. There's a real ubiquity of tables in modern day culture, but they are such rich repositories of information about the actual practices of the actors who are compiling them. And the way in which that the more <coughs> uh, algorithmic, um, pure descriptions of phenomena were actually realised in terms of numbers and put in rows and columns. So interestingly enough, we find that tables in Sanskrit sources are rather late on the scene, at least in terms of works that are really, truly tabular. Of course, we do see works with uh, scribes doing tables in them from very early, but they tend to appear around the beginning of the second millennium and then become supremely popular. It's interesting to consider the ways, and I hope to, you know, we hope to do that over the period of the next uh, many years, to see how, in fact, tables impact the way that astronomers actually practised. Of course, they're also hugely valu valuable for the historian because they do represent these um, things. And lastly, of course, tables are an amazing testament to the enormous efforts of the peoples that compiled them. Again, with computers, we forget what it is to recompute figures and values, and you look just this one page of ta tables here has many different values that have been computed. We have some manuscripts that are this thick. It's just So we rightly call the people that compile these things true gunnikas or computers in that sense. Okay, so let's look <clears throat> at this process of turning uh, uh, karanas or, or textual works into tabular ones. So we have many examples of um, important works that were at some later point in time by some different author trans, uh, recast, if you like, into tables. For instance, we've got Brahmagupta's Kandakajika. We have <coughs> a manuscript of this so-called Kandakajika Sarani. I think it's only a few folio, but at least testifies to perhaps a larger work or effort um, recasting Brahmagupta's results here into tables. We have the so-called Surya Siddhanta Sarani. In fact, we've got two versions of Ganesha's Graha Lagava, one composed by Nilakanta and another by um, a scholar called Porema, within about 30 years of each other. And lastly and importantly, which I'll look at today, we've got the Karanakatuhala, which was recast um, as tables and called the Brahma Tulya Sarani. So you may be asking, why do we want to... Um, well, actually, before we ask that question, let's just look at the broader questions that are interesting when we consider this transition from a textual work to a table one. What are some of the differences? I mean, there are very trivial differences, if you like. We replace words and uh, words that describe algorithms with actual numbers. Uh, instead of having, you know, continuous lines of text, we've got rows and columns and the like. But what are some of the, I mean, and these differences are important to point out, but what are also some of the more or less um, evident differences between the tables and the text? And what can tabular data tell us about the actual hand computations that were uh, carried out by scholars in second millennium Sanskrit sources? That's why ta uh, tabular data is a real wealth testifying to people actually putting into practice these algorithms. And lastly, of course, with my sort of historian hat on and faced with all these piles of tables and numerical data with all these conflicts, uh, how on earth do we make sense of making an addition, even a critical addition, of tables when you have got um, a, a, a table with various manuscripts? Um, how do we account for tabular variations, which of course are much more complicated because they become spatial than uh, textual sources. Okay, so to look at some of these uh, issues, we'll look at this case study, the Karanakatuhala to the Brahma Tuli Sarani. For those of you who don't know too much about the Karanakatuhala, you'll say, um, why do you see them the same? Um, and in fact, because they've got different names. Well, um, the Karanakatuhala, in fact, was also known as the Brahma Tulia and in various formats, and um, it was around 10 chapters, it was 10 chapters, a versified text covering a wide variety of astronomical topics, and thank you to Kim for covering some of those. The Brahma Tulia Sarani, of course we get that by just um, putting on the end of Brahma Tulia Sarani, a word for tables. 
We have one manuscript which is actually unavailable to me in the colophon which says this was composed by a certain Nagadatta. Um, this is reported in uh, David Pingree's CES. I can't verify to the colophon, but perhaps he was the particular author. The manuscripts that I have, which are five in number, do not um, talk about any authorship, but they do get information about the scribes in the colophon. The Brahma Tulin Sarani um, uh, is actually known in one of the manuscripts that we're working on as the Karana Katuhala Sarani. So that's another reason why we can be uh, confident that the two are related. So we have a bunch of tables, we've got the headline material, we've got um, in one of the manuscripts a short text which describes how to use the table which Professor Profka and I are working on and covers the content of chapters one and two, and perhaps I've got in brackets three and four, so it looks at finding the true positions of the planets. So here's one of the tables from the Karanakatuhu. I thought I'd just give you a sort of a visual overview of it. We have here mean longitude table for Venus, which as you can uh, see without reading any of the numbers, is delimited into four distinct sections. We go from uh, zero to 29 here, which are our uh, mean longitudes day by day, and then we have the 12 months of the year here, which are our mean longitudes for these sort of ideal months of 30 days, and then from 1 to 20 years here, and then from 20 year periods down the bottom. We also have what I should probably have put, and I have down the bottom, these declination or these lunar latitude tables, and what says in the title, an Udiantara uh, correction, we also have, of course, the Munda correction tables, just a quick overview here, which, um, as you'll notice, of course, uh, we're used to reading tables and spreadsheets where our numbers are, we can read them from more left to right, but of course we have here the argument which runs from left to right along the page here we've got 1 to 30, 31 to 60, and 61 to 90, and the numbers hang down underneath, so rushes, and then we go to degrees, and then minutes and seconds and so forth and so on. And you can see we've got various different functions underneath the same argument here, which usually are related in terms of the second row, are in fact the differences here, and another one called the gutty fella, which we may look at later. So there's our Munda equation tables, and of course our Shiga equation tables, which we need many, several folios to go over because of course they're not symmetrical, about 90 degrees, but rather 180. Okay, <clears throat> so before we look at some of the differences between tables and texts, which I raised before, let's look at some of the similarity. Of course, they share their, their name. And they've got the same epoch date. And with those, if you uh, look at carefully the mean motion, they've got the same epoch longitudes. Um, of course, they're woven in a little bit discreetly in the mean motion tables, but they uh, occupy an entire verse in the text. The mean daily motions are, to a large extent, the same. The sine function, they share... They've got many parameters, manned apogees, the radii of the Shigra epicycles, so those from the Karana Katuhala. Um, the algorithms to compute irrelevant equations appear to be those which generate the numbers in the table, and they've got similar paratexts. That is, if you're looking at some of the texts surrounding the tables, there's snippets from the Karana Katuhala uh, quoted out, not always whole verses, but just little amounts, depending on perhaps how much the scribe thinks necessary. So if you think of the Siddhanta Shiromani abbreviate, uh, being an abbreviate, bre abbreviated by the Karana Katuhala, this is even more of an abbreviation, if you like. So those are some of the similarities, but what are the differences? And here at the back of your mind, you can think of, imagine trying to make an addition with some of these differences. Well, the Brahma Tula Sarani only takes a little bit of the Karana Katuhala, at least in the manuscripts that we've got. The format is obviously different, so we go from text to numerical um, data. The order of topics can be different, and not only does the order different from the Karana Katuhala proper, but in fact, if we look at the different manuscripts, the scribes have decided to order things differently too, possibly according to how they um, personally want to compute them. The precision. That is, the number of significant figures for some of the uh, parameters, such as mean motion, is different from that given in the Karana Katuhula, and some numerical parameters are different. And there are also some bigger differences that we see, which are more a spin-off. Nobody's suggesting that you would sit down and memorise a table, okay? You just can't memorise that many numbers, whereas, so it's for consultation rather than recitation. So there are different ways in which the tables are obviously going to be used 
as well as the engagement. Of course, tables are really easy to use because you just usually have to look up and at the most do some sort of interpolation between the two, which is basic arithmetic, but of course they're very hard on the person that's computing them just in terms of the time and needing to understand the algorithms. So we see these problems not just when we're comparing the Karanakatuhala and the Brahmatulu Sarani, but in fact between the manuscripts themselves as well. All of them differ, perhaps uh, dependent on what the scribe has thought is relevant. So let's have a look at this change of format. Uh, so let's look at the Manda anomaly. This is one of the, um, as we've seen many times over the last few days, the Manda being uh, explained. The text, the, very quickly, this text goes, the signs of Manda anomalies, beginning with the sun, is to be multiplied by 10 and divided by 550, etc. So we see for the sun, you t multiply whatever the appropriate sign is uh, and then divide by 550. Here is that bit of information, in fact, just the last line, of this algorithm encoded in a table. Okay, so if we go one more slide. So if we take, just take a little bit, for instance, and follow the algorithm for um, an argument of 70, so we take the sign of 70, multiply it by 10 and divide it by 550, we get this amount here. Then if we uh, take the sign of 80, multiply it by 10, divide by 550, we get this amount here. And the uh, maximum munda, which of course is number to many of you, the 2, 10, 54. And if we look at the table of those amounts, whoops, that's exactly what we get. Only, so we've got for 90, our 2, 10, 54, our 80, and our amounts, and of course. But the difference with the tables are these little dot, dot, dots in between. How have these been computed for intermediate amounts? So the table directly testifies to something that is not explained in the verse. So if you look, we have these amounts here for 80 and for 70 and so forth. And this next row here is a difference column. For those of you that can squint at those Devanagari numerals, you'll see they are the same for every 10 values. Okay, there's differences. So the scribe or the compiler of the Brahma Tuli Sarani has computed for each 10 degrees according to the Karanakatula and they use linear interpolation to generate the in, in, uh, in between instances. So there's an example of how an algorithm actually can be um, applied in principle. Change in precision. Here's another one. Uh, we've got our solar mean motion table here. As I said, we've got these four distinct sections which go day by day, month by month, the special ideal months, year by year, and 20-year um, period by 20-year period. From the text, um, Buskara tells us um, in two separate places um, the number of civil days multiplied by 13 and divided by 903 um, gives the mean daily motion, um, which is amounts to the mean daily motion of the sun is 890 divided by 903, which can be multiplied out like this. He also explicitly states at 59, 8 minutes. Here's two examples from the tables um, computing this day by day. We'll see this particular manuscript has, just like Basker has said, gone 59, 8, and then taken various multiples. This table compiler has decided to go one extra place. Okay, 59, 8, 10, and so forth. And in fact, what we can tell about these differences, you can see we're differing by 10, 10, 10, and we're differing by 11 here, but sorry, another 10, but we've flipped up one, which suggests that he's actually carrying on a place which is different to this one that we find in the Karanakatuhala to generate his entries. So then maybe he's using a slightly modified um, impression of what his mean solar motion is. So there's some ways in which the tables can subtly adjust um, some of the base parameters from the Karanakatuhala. The other thing is assimilation of epoch. The epoch, has, uh, epoch position of the sun has been incorporated not at the start, because we start with 00598, but rather in this amount here, which is the first 20-year period. And of course, it's not direct, but um, so any time you want to compute the sun that's less than 20 years after the epoch, of course, you'll need to be very careful. But this suggests that um, these tables were to be used quite some decades, and even, I would argue, from other data, centuries of the actual epoch date of the Karanakatuhala. We can tell this by this interesting one here, which is the, so it's the same table, but we have a slightly different value here, and rather than be the first 20-year period, it's telling us it's the 30th 20-year period. So this, in fact, uh, is giving you 
the ability to calculate the mean motion of the sun some uh, 60 uh, year periods after the, um, the epoch dates to suggest that these uh, tables were compiled later. So here's the sort of information that's embedded in these otherwise boring lists of numbers. We can tell something about perhaps the date in which these were intended to be used by their practitioners by just having a little bit of a crunch of the numbers. Here's another very interesting one. Um, lunar latitude, so from the Karakatuhala, many of you will know this, the, um, the uh, maximum lunar latitude, of course, is this figure 430, which is typically too low. What do we find in these tables? We find this maximum value here. We've gone uh, lunar latitude from up to 90 here, 543, which is slightly too high, of course, but vastly different from the Karakatuhala. And then in another manuscript, we have it here, which they've decided to go 2 by 2 by 2, so we go 2, 4, 6, 8. We've got the solar declination on top underneath the lunar latitude. And this one, they've decided to go to three significant places, and it is 5, 42, 51. All right? So there's some of the variations that can occur. So this is obviously some different function for lunar latitude that the author has thought is better and more proper to use. Interestingly enough, got one, two more minutes, right? Uh, this table of solar declination and lunar latitude doesn't indicate that it's solar declination or lunar latitude at all. In fact, in the title, I'm going to show you three copies of the same table um, with their three different titles. Say nothing here. We've got Atta Ravi Chandra Yo Uri Yantaram Koshtakaha. Koshtaka means these tabular entries. Um, and underneath um, this interesting phrase here, Bujang Shopari, I've just copied it straight, I haven't attempted to correct the Sanskrit here, um, so tabulated for the degrees under the Buja, this interesting use of the term Upari here. Same table, different scribe, you can see, just looking at it very quickly, the title is much more detailed, it says nothing about declination, nothing about lunar latitude, but we do get this interesting Udyantaram correction here with some information about how to apply it in the various quadrants for those of you who can sc scan through the Sanskrit. Again, the last copy of the very same table, you'll notice slightly longer but not very much information here, but some of the same stuff. So what is this table? Is it in fact a declination table? What is this Udyantara stuff? And in fact, if you look carefully, um, so there are the three titles compared. You can see they're quite different depending on what the scribe is useful to include. We can compare it with a rule in the Karana Katuhala, which describes the so-called Uriyantara correction, um, which, um, in fact, the second title has beautifully um, adapted the verse of the Karana Katuhala, taking a bit. So, in fact, in a sense, this is two, t two functions for the price of one. Okay, so we've, we can find the declination, we can find the lunar latitude, and with a little bit of um, arithmetical manipulation, as discussed in the paratext around the table, we can also find this Udiantara correction. So these are just some of the, um, and that in fact explains here, uh, these here, for those of you, Vicar, um, we've got the columns here, it's calling the solar declination to be measured in vicolas and the uh, lunar latitude to be measured in kalas and vicolas, and of course that's crazy because we need to be measuring these in degrees, these are far too small. So at first uh, we thought, you know, this is some scribe who's just got his metrics confused, but in fact it makes perfect sense that this is in fact uh, the Udiantara correction for the sun and the moon. Okay. So, table with two functions. So, just having a little um, tidbit of some of the differences that can be introduced when computing tables from textual data. Um, what, how do we, and I'm, I believe this is an open question for you, about how we are to approach compiling an addition of tables, a critical addition. Are we to imagine that each table in, its, in and of itself is a unique entity and not even attempt to do a critical edition of the tables. We've seen how even maxima of tables can be quite different. Do we preserve the original format of this interesting sort of horizontal 
reading with the vertical entries underneath, how do we make sense of the fact that much of the paratext surrounding the titles can be so wildly different? And then how do we incorporate the basis of the tables, which are usually stem from some other text, such as in this case the Kararaka Tuhala. How do we incorporate that into informing us about the addition of the tables? So I'll leave you with those questions. Uh, uh, and this is something wonderful to chew over to think about how to process these texts, these table texts, and um, uh, codify them for future historians. Thank you. Thank you, very much. you uh, carefully, perhaps carefully, didn't say anything about some of the similarities between the text, the verses of the text, and the Karanakatuhala. Could you, you know, perhaps take a, um, a glance at the plagiarism issue, or perhaps pseudo Bhaskara issue? You know, is there um, uh, combining this with the fact that the tables were clearly or evidently not composed until a while after the Karanakatuhala's own epoch, meaning by the time that the Karanakatuhala had become famous, is somebody trying to you know, ride Bhaskara's coattails, so to speak, on the authority of his name, as well as borrowing his words? Okay, excellent question, and of course, very pertinent when you're thinking about how to best uh, document the critical edition. So Dr. Plofka is referring to the 10 verses which is appended to one copy of these tables we have which t uh, describe how to use the tables. Many entire padas have been taken straight out of the Karanakatuhala. So I haven't looked at any of these examples here, but um, what I will do to sort of get to talk about these more visually is to look at the, the similarities between one of these titles here, which deals with this Uriyantara correction, and the verse for the Karana Katuhala. So if you look this Dvignasya, um, where do we have it? Yeah, here we go. Dvignasya Dorja, Sharahur Vilipta. So he's just quoting directly here um, this little bit here, um, some of it. So he's clearly just lifting entire phrases from Bhaskara. Um, I think it's an interesting question, because we're quite conscious of plagiarism in modern days um, in terms of the importance of recognising the work of somebody else in our academic publications and, and so forth. So when we directly quote some, something, we've been trained very carefully to reference it so we can go back to the original source. I wonder what the standards were in those particular days and that whether we really can call it plagiarising. I mean, perhaps that's um, or rather... I mean, it seems if you're going to uh, create a set of tables that are based on the uh, Karana Katuhala, that people will understand the origin of it uh, and not be so judgmental of sort of a plagiarism, but understand that that's being incorporated. I suppose that's a quick answer for it anyway. Could you say something about the location where these tables could have been made? We do have colophons for the... Um, no, Naga Bhatta, where oh, yeah. could he be from? I have no idea. We have another person called Maluka Chandra, I, um, but nobody says anything. And because it's mean and true motions, there's no way we can play with the numerical data the to get out. language, the script? So actually, somebody could help me with this. This, uh, this stuff here, if you want to come up afterwards, is not strictly Sanskrit. It's quoting some bits of the Karanakatuhala. Um, I'm not sure I know what it is. Um, so no, that, 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 that might be a clue. Question. But other than that, we just have no idea. And it's not like you know he doesn't cite a lunar eclipse or anything where we could look at particular, you know, crunching the numbers to find out the information that way. I have a related question. Uh, uh, No, I think the only account we have of the anthropological account, let's say, of a practicing calculator, uh, this is what Nagyabhair has quoted, the uh, Dijentil's uh, encounter with the calculator. 
Ah, uh, right. And so there, there is no table involved. Right. That man is having some cowrie shells, and he is stating something, some formula or whatever. Then he calculates the eclipse. This is Lee Shantil's account, which is widely stated. And later on, I think Warren's account is also something very similar. Mm -hmm. That there is no table which is being used. Perhaps in retrospect, we can think it is the Vakyas, which they are uh, sort of memorized Vakyas that they are saying and right, so using cowrie tables. shells. Yeah. But there is no uh, lookup tables that they are using. But that may be in South India. I don't mean you Right. Have so yes, I think um, probably it's hard to estimate how many tables exist. At first we were quite conservative and just look at the catalogues that have been done already, but more and more we uncover, such as Balachandra Rao um, and, uh, suggested this morning, the sort of the tables that are done in vernacular sources or in, you know, found in tiny small villages where s uh, scholars are not likely to well, uh, take their time to find them, um, might be might well, much more widespread and much more regional variety of the sorts of things that are getting tabulated. So it's a very good question. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to your uh, speaker and uh,